Today's episode is brought to you by NordVPN. After the incident with Laban that saw Laban leaving Gilead and agreeing to leave Jacob alone, Jacob and his family also went on their way, only to soon find themselves in the company of angels. When Jacob saw these angels of God, he told them that this was a camp of God, and so that very place was named Mahanaim. It is unknown why the angels showed themselves to Jacob here, but some have deduced that this was God's way of confirming to Jacob that he was on the right path, and that he had handled matters with Laban exactly as he should have. It may also be seen as a holy welcoming, in that now that Jacob had left the unholy company of Laban, he was now being welcomed to a new part of his life, and a new part of God's plan. In any case, the sight of angels was likely of great comfort and encouragement to Jacob, and so he was not dismayed in his journey to return home, even with the prospect of meeting Esau again no doubt looming over his head. Before we make a start with today's video though, a brief message from the sponsor of today's episode, NordVPN. A VPN stands for a Virtual Private Network, and is a service offered by NordVPN that will encrypt your internet activity and also protect your identity when online. With so much of our sensitive information now stored online, from bank details to home addresses, internet security is a must-have for any browser of the web. NordVPN will ensure that all of your internet usage is redirected through a specially configured remote server, which will see your IP address hidden and encrypt all the data you send and receive. This means your data will be unreadable to any would-be hackers. So there's no need to worry about connecting to the Wi-Fi at the airport or at your local copy shop. Because with NordVPN, your passwords, banking details, credit card numbers, and other private details will all be encrypted. Personally, I've used Nord to get peace of mind when accessing public Wi-Fi. Not only can I browse with confidence, but I can rest assured that my data isn't being spied upon or accessed by any dubious characters. Right now, NordVPN is having its 10th anniversary, and to celebrate, they're offering a great deal where every purchase of a two-year plan will get you an additional month and a super special gift. Just go to nordvpn.com slash the legend and use the code legends. And now back to Jacob's adventure. As you may remember, Jacob had schemed against Esau in an effort to obtain both the birthright and their father's blessing. Those which would see Jacob not only inherit everything that Isaac owned, but also the divine benefits that ought to have been owed to Esau, him being the firstborn. Esau did not take these slights against him lightly and vowed to kill Jacob for his trickery. Fearing for his life, Jacob's mother sent him away to her brother Laban, where he would be out of the reach of his enraged older brother. Fast forward some years, and now, Jacob was preparing to face the inevitable in his journeying home, the moment he came face to face once more with Esau. We see that Jacob sends messengers ahead of him to visit Esau in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom, perhaps as a precaution. Naturally, he did not want to risk appearing to his brother for fear of being killed on sight. It was safer to send messengers instead, those that would notify Esau of his return and perhaps, in some capacity, seek favour from him. The Bible tells us, Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, This is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favour in your eyes. Here we can gather that Jacob wants to reconcile with his brother. You might say that Jacob is only doing this because he fears punishment at the hands of his brother but his message appears to be quite genuine. You'll notice he does refer to Esau as his lord and refers to himself as his servant, even though he had achieved both the blessing and the birthright 
albeit by dubious means. In this, it might be said that Jacob truly was humbled by his experience with Laban, and now recognised not only the error in his trickster ways, but also how much this must have hurt Esau. He proceeds to gift his brother with both cattle and servants, and while some more suspicious readers may consider this to be a bribe, it's more likely to be a genuine effort of apology on behalf of Jacob. When the messengers returned to Jacob, however, they only added to his anxieties. They told him, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Naturally, Jacob began to fear the worst. It would appear that with Esau's gathering of 400 men, he had not forgotten the bad blood between them. With this message, Jacob was convinced that Esau and these 400 men were coming to kill him and his family. In order to further prepare for this contingency, Jacob chose to divide his people into two groups, as well as the flocks and herds and camels as well. He believed that if Esau came to attack one of the groups, then the other may still escape. Evidently, we can certainly sense Jacob's fear and distress, in that he is taking such precautions in response to his brother. Such precautions may also be indicative of Jacob's guilt, in that he now knew he was in the wrong, and was now doing his best to mitigate the damage that his brother had some right in causing. In this, believers may draw the conclusion that if one is to wrong another, comeuppance is inescapable, as Jacob was most certainly beginning to understand. Interestingly, we see Jacob yet again struggle with his belief in God, for though he had just met with the angels, which confirmed his allegiance with God, he still experiences such dread of Esau and prepares for the worst outcome, perhaps highlighting his precarious faith. But in order to remedy this, we do see Jacob pray to God, stating, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper, and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea which cannot be counted. Here we see that Jacob has become more attuned with God, in that in his time of need, he does turn to his Lord, instead of scheming any further. He acknowledges his God's promises, and comes to the realisation that his God would not lie to him, and that if he had already promised that he would make him prosper, and that his descendants would be many, then it would surely come to pass. In this, believers may derive that clarity can come from prayer, and that no matter how bleak a situation may be, relief may come simply from conversing with one's God. Here in this instance, Jacob also comes to realise that his God had not abandoned him thus far, and so it was foolish to believe he would do so now. He is also authentic with his God, explaining his fears of Esau and his trepidation at having to face him again which then, you might say, allows God to give Jacob the strength to do so. In another moment of growth, we also see Jacob reducing himself to nothing and shedding his ego by declaring that he is not worthy of all of his God's mercies, showcasing not only his humility, but also his succumbing to his God. He then spends the night here, at this spot, and from his possessions on hand, he selected a gift for Esau. The gift, however, was by no means a meagre offering, for he selected 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. He also put these animals in the care of his servants and instructed them to go ahead of him as they ready to cross paths with Esau. Here we see that Jacob truly does wish to make amends with his brother, and by offering such an impressive gift, 
there can be no doubt as to how remorseful he really is. However, you might also say that whilst Jacob did not intend to receive anything of a physical gift in return, he was perhaps hoping to earn his brother's favour, and in effect, buy his way back into his brother's good graces. It's interesting that after having just prayed to God to deliver him, Jacob returns to his own schemes again, for if he truly did trust his God, he wouldn't have sent his servants with a gift, but would have instead gone to meet his brother on his own. We see him instruct his servants that, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, who do you belong to, and where are you going, and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. Once more, we see Jacob address himself as Esau's servant, and it becomes apparent that he wishes to make it clear that he concedes before his brother and wishes not to challenge him. He also instructs the servants that you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. The Bible tells us that that night the gifts went ahead of Jacob, but Jacob himself spent the night in the camp. That very same night, we see Jacob take both Rachel and Leah, as well as the two female servants and his eleven sons, and cross the ford of Jabbok. After having sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. This in effect left Jacob alone on the east side of the Jordan River, with none of his possessions, his family, or schemes. It is unknown how Jacob spent this night, but it might be theorised that he spent this night praying to God. However, you might also say that with Jacob finally alone, God was able to command his unmitigated attention, and thus was able to manifest before him in the presence of a man. Now, the Bible only specifies this entity as a man, though it is generally agreed that this was God. Yet, in classical depictions of this event, this man is frequently depicted as an angel, which gives the idea that either God had sent one of his angels to visit Jacob, or that he had taken the form of an angel and come to visit him himself. In any case, upon meeting each other, we are led to believe that the two came to blows. The Bible tells us, So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Now this man, whose identity we can agree was God, engages with a physical confrontation with Jacob. For many, this is a symbolic representation of Jacob's relationship with God, in that he struggled time and time again against God with his need to scheme and strategize. To some, it may also be representative of Jacob's inability to completely trust his God, and that this could be metaphorized as a fight. Yet, in another idea, God can be seen as the instigator of this fight, for the Bible tells us that this man wrestled with Jacob, implying that this man confronted Jacob. It might be said that this was God at his last straw with Jacob, and that because Jacob had not fully accepted him when he offered him kindness, he now resorted to offering him a beating instead. In this encounter, one might say that God was demonstrating his strength in the only way that Jacob could understand, and in doing so, he hoped to prove Jacob once and for all that no one was as strong as him. We have some idea as to how the fight went down, and for those who don't know the story, you might find it quite surprising. We know that Jacob wrestled this man until daybreak, revealing that somehow, Jacob was able to hold his own against God throughout the entire night, and there is an implication here that despite God's almighty strength, Jacob managed to earn a stalemate. Many thus have pondered on how Jacob managed to keep up his struggle throughout the entire night, and there are many ideas. Some state that this was exemplary of Jacob's stubbornness and his unwillingness to fully trust God. Others believe that God had only used a fraction of his power, and that if he wanted to crush Jacob, he very well could have 
but wanted to exhaust Jacob to show him the folly of his ways. It might also be said that God reduced his own power to match Jacob's, so as to ensure a fair fight, which is why neither of them appear to achieve the upper hand. But the Bible then tells us, when the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. Here we see the man, or God, turn the tide of the battle almost instantly, by merely touching Jacob's hip. It is here that believers point to the power of God, in that though he seemed to struggle himself against Jacob's strength, in the end, he could have won the battle at any time by a mere touch. Jacob's hip is pretty much dislocated by this single contact, and with this move, there can be no doubt as to which of the two were stronger. Though props to Jacob for quite literally boxing with God in the first place. Believers may also see this encounter as a metaphor for man's arrogance, in that there are times that man may see himself above God, or on God's level, much as many of the characters in the Bible do, and whilst they may seem as powerful as God, as Jacob appears here, they are ultimately undone with the slightest of strokes. It might be agreed by believers that God allows man to soar with his arrogance only so that he may crush and orchestrate his own punishment. In Jacob's case, he suffers a painful injury by having his hip dislocated. What's interesting is that having dislocated Jacob's hip, God still requests Jacob to let him go, though this is much less a plea but more of a command. He wanted Jacob to release him as a sign of the man's own submission, but to his credit, or foolishness, Jacob does not submit. Even with a dislocated hip, Jacob replies, I will not let you go unless you bless me. We see a more candid portrayal here of Jacob's determination and resistance. Despite the struggle, he refuses to let go of God, and though this may appear blasphemous, it also highlights Jacob's resilience, something we know he has in abundance, given his servitude to Laban. Having been struck on the hip, he knew he could not defeat his opponent, but he still clung on, hoping to gain something from this encounter. What's even more interesting is that Jacob appears to recognize this man as God, given that he asks him for a blessing, and instead of collapsing before God in defeat, chooses instead to hold on to him. Believers may argue that this isn't necessarily a bad place to be, and that this is symbolic of Jacob having finally accepted his God, for now that he stood alone, without his schemes, without his family, and without his possessions, he had only God to hold on to. In this, you might say that it is in Jacob's weakness that he prevailed, for in his most dire moment, he clung to God. What is your name? The man is shown to ask Jacob, and when Jacob answers, the man tells him, your name is no longer Jacob, but Israel because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Here Jacob earns himself a change in name, where he is believed to go forth as Israel, sharing the name of the country to be. To some, the name Israel is to mean one who struggles with God, which is perfect for one such as Jacob, both on a spiritual and now a physical level. Yet a more principled definition suggests that Israel means God rules. In this, you might say that this was God's way of recognizing Jacob as finally having learned his lesson, and finally having reconciled that his God was the only way. So it is interesting that Jacob is still referred to as Jacob in the subsequent chapters, far more than he is referred to as Israel, perhaps suggesting that even with this recent encounter, Jacob never really did come to trust God completely. When Jacob inquires as to who the man is, the man responds indifferently, asking him, why do you ask my name? It was probably a pointless question for Jacob to ask, given that this was obviously God, and Jacob knew this was God having asked for his blessing. But again, you might say that this was Jacob yet again seeking confirmation 
for having not truly believed what was happening before his eyes. But in any case, God does not address this and proceeds to bless Jacob all the same. After this, Jacob is seen to name the place where they fought as Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. This name, Peniel, was believed to have meant the face of God, for here Jacob had seen God with his own two eyes, albeit God in the form of a man. He appears to be grateful for having his life spared, for he recognised that he was probably one of the only people thus far to have engaged God with such an affront and lived to tell the tale. Such was the mercy of his God. The Bible concludes the chapter by telling us, The sun rose above him as it passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near his tendon. Here we understand that Jacob limped for the rest of his days because of the injury he had sustained at the hands of God. In a poetic kind of way, you might say that whilst Jacob might have continued to second guess his God, he would never forget him, for forevermore he would be reminded of his Lord with every step he took, a painful reminder of how he was once conquered by the Almighty. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode on Biblical Stories Explained, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.